Hello, loved ones. We are so happy that you chose to join us again today. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, once again we come to say thank you and asking that you would open our hearts and minds to receive you. Father, we realize that unless you give the increase, nothing will happen. Father, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are still on article number 12, the harmony of the law and the gospel. And our author writes, we believe that the law of God is the eternal and unchangeable rule of his moral government, that it is holy, just, and good, and that the inability which the scripture ascribes to fallen men to fulfill its precepts arises entirely from their love of sin to deliver them from which, and to restore them through a mediator to unfeigned obedience to the holy law is one great end of the gospel and of the means of grace connected with the establishment of the visible church. So we are continuing today with Galatians, the third chapter, verses 19 through 25 out of the uh, NIV version. And it says, what then was the purpose of the law? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was put into effect through angels by a mediator. A mediator, however, does not represent just one party, but God is one. Is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then the righteousness would then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But the scripture declares that the whole world is a prisoner of sin, so that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Now that fate has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. And so because our main scripture is concerning the promise given to Abraham, we decided to first look at the promise. And today uh, we'll pick back up where we left off. We've got uh, three lessons uh, speaking of the promise. And then today we will kind of wrap it up. So if you have missed uh, any of those three lessons, any lessons, period, uh, it's out there on YouTube. That's one of the great things about YouTube is that at your convenience, you can go back, check it out, and listen to it. And so God's last unfolding of the promise to Abraham is found in Genesis, the 22nd chapter, verses 15 through 18. And this is the King James Version of Genesis, the 22nd chapter, verses 15 through 18. It says, And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of the heaven the second time, and said, By myself have I sworn, said the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thine only, withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing, I will bless thee, and in multiplying, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashores, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. And so this revelation of God's promise comes after God tests Abraham yet again. But, and this time he told him to take his son, Isaac, his only son, and sacrifice him on the altar. Now we should point out that God testing of Abraham was not so that God would see what he would do. God is all knowing. He, he doesn't have to wait to see what we're going to do to know what his next move, next move is going to be. God has known since the beginning of time what each one of us will do. So God tested Abraham to make Abraham's faith known to Abraham. 
and to make his faith known to us, the world. Abraham is the father of all believers, and rightly so. And so God shows us uh, Abraham's faith by testing him. And his faith in God is beyond amazing. And this test makes it known and it makes it known to the world so much so that we're studying it today. Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verse 17 through 19, and this is the NIV. It says, by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead, and figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. So y'all, that is some kind of faith. And it's also strengthening to me and should be strengthening to you in those dark times of life to read it to to read that that abraham was willing to sacrifice his son he was willing to go there for god god asked abraham to sacrifice his only son this son who was that was a major part of god's promise this son that that the blessings of Abraham would flow through. This son that had been given to him in his old age, everything was tied up in this son. And yet Abraham was willing to sacrifice him without question. Why? Because his faith in God was so solid that he believed in his heart that, that if he killed Isaac, that God would raise him back to life again. That is faith. When I read that, it puts my stuff to scale. I, I mean, my stuff is small compared to that. I will never be asked to do that. So what is my problem in believing God for my situation that never rises to the level of, 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 of Abraham sacrificing Isaac? So after passing that test, God calls to Abram, Abraham a second time. And in, in, in case you're wondering when was the first time, it was when Abraham was about to kill his son. God called out to stop him. He said, Abraham, Abraham, that's what you're about to do. Don't do it. And, and then it was, it was then that Abraham looked around and saw a ram caught in the thicket by his horns, which he got and sacrifice it in the place of Isaac. And Abraham, after going through that and, and, and God providing the ram, Abraham called that place Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. And so with that as a backdrop, I read again, Genesis, the 22nd chapter, verses 15 through 18 in the King James Version. It says, and the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of the heavens the second time and said, by myself have I sworn, said the Lord, for because thou has done this thing and has not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore and thou seed shall possess the gate gate of his enemy and verse 18 and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou has obeyed my voice hopefully that gave it some some more uh, that 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 you and i need it god's promise to abraham is confirmed with an oath all nations he says will be blessed in abraham and his seed abraham and his seed are to possess the land forever and then abraham is to be the father of an innumerable seed and then abraham's name is to be great now note that the seed s-e-e-d in verse 17 is singular and not plural, meaning that Abraham is to be the father of a singular seed who will conquer all enemies. 
and that seed is Jesus. And, and, and here is where we tie it all together uh, to what Paul says in Galatians, the 19th, the third chapter, verse 19 through 25. Paul says in verse 19 that the law was put into effect through angels by a mediator. God gave the law, remember, to the children of Israel in Mount Sinai. And it was a terrifying experience. There was thunder and lightning and trumpets and trumpets blasting and loud and, and thick clouds and, and smoke and fire and the mountains shaking. And then out of all that, God's voice from heaven. Now, y'all, he could have just did the thunder and the lightning and that would have got me. That would have ter terrified me enough. I'm just saying, uh, you know, when sometimes that thunder and lightning come, it, even now, it can terrify us or maybe just me. But to add all that of, of that, all the other effects, plus the voice of God in the midst, I get why the people told Moses, you speak to us, not God. So Moses stood as mediator between God and the people to bring them God's spoken word. Moses was considered to be the lawgiver and mediator of the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. And Moses' office as mediator and lawgiver was a physical type of Jesus Christ, who would be the spiritual lawgiver. When the children of Israel was about to enter the promised land and Moses was reminding them uh, of God's requirements, Moses revealed to them in Deuteronomy, the 18th chapter, verse 18 and 19, he revealed a prophecy that God gave him when the people were fearful during that time at, at the mountain. And, 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 and in Deuteronomy, the 18th chapter, verse 17 through 19, this is the King James Version. It says, and the Lord said to me, they have well spoken that which they have spoken. I will raise them up a prophet, and that prophet is Jesus, from among their brethren, like unto thee, meaning like comparable to Moses, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he spake, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. So then the law was put into effect by Moses, who served as mediator between God and the people. But Paul goes on to say in Galatians, the third chapter, verse 20, a mediator, however, does not represent just one party, but God is one. So Jesus, throughout his teachings, confirmed that he was the one that Moses spoke of. And that he only spoke the word given to him by the Father. So clearly, the spiritual office of Jesus surpasses the physical office of Moses. Whereas Moses serving as mediator represented God to the people and the people to God, Christ is God manifest in the flesh. He is one. So he's, the, he, he's, he's not speaking through a mediator. He is the one and he's just one at mount sinai the people couldn't stand to hear god's voice because of the thunder and the lightning and the smoke and the fire and, and all that that was going on but in jesus the word of god is spoken in such a way that all can hear at the mountain the law was given and and and, and required strict obedience, even in the giving of the law, not just obeying the law, but even in the giving of the law. Remember, for two days, they had to consecrate themselves. They had to clean up their physical selves. And if a person came too close to the mountain, Moses roped off the mountain. And if a person came too close to the mountain, they were put to death. It was a fearful time. The law was given through fear. But John speaks of Jesus as the word. He said, the word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. In the old covenant, the word of God came through Moses as a mediator. In the new covenant, the word became flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. And he, 
the word dwelt among us. He walked with us. He talked with us. John says, and we beheld his glory. In the old covenant, the people only saw the glory of God secondhand when Moses came off the mountain. After seeing God's glory, Moses was on the mountain. Remember, he wanted to see God's glory and God held, hid him in the cleft and, and, and kind of after as he passed by, he took his hand away from so that Moses could see the backside. And so Moses saw his glory as he passed by. And even that scared the people because when Moses came down and he was literally glowing, the folks said, whoa, we can't handle this. You need to cover yourself up. So Moses had to cover his, put a shield on his face so that the people uh, wouldn't be fearful. But John says in the New Testament, we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Think about that. All the grace and truth, however much that is, is in Jesus. He is full of grace and truth. In Christ is the fullness of everything we need. I, I hear somebody say, what about mercy? It's tied up in grace. If it were not for grace, Mercy would not exist. In the fullness of grace and truth is everything we need. The songwriter said, he, he said, it's at the table. Everything we need in essence is at the table. He says, come on in where the table is spread and the feast of the Lord is going on. Joy is there. Love, healing, salvation, wholeness, peace. It's all there. Full of grace and truth. It is there. If you need more strength and power, relief from your burdens and pain, seeking for joy in your sorrow, it's all there. Feast and you will never be the same. Christ, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. Well, loved ones, that's all for today. I invite you to experience his fullness in the weeks, the months, the years, the life to come. He has all the grace and truth we need. Until then, until next time, be blessed and come back and join us. Goodbye. Love you.